Hello, everybody. This is uh, Morten from Inkish. Um, uh, this uh, episode today is maybe a little bit different from, or it is different from uh, most of the uh, these kind of online issues I've done in the past. Uh, I'm talking to my good friend uh, Rob Enns from uh, uh, Toronto in Canada. So uh, welcome on Inkish, uh, Rob. Thank you. It's very nice to speak with you. Likewise, uh, it's not so many days ago or weeks ago since we met in uh, Düsseldorf at Drupal. That was super nice that you had time to come and see a very stressed editor. <laughs> That's probably, that was one of the reasons I actually went. I really wanted to see you there in action. <laughs> And uh, we managed, pleasure. so that's good. And then, um, yeah, and then you reach out to me, or actually, you, you came with a comment because um, I have decided to go to Ukraine uh, next week to cover a story about a printing company that deliberately by the Russians were bombed uh, on May twenty fourth. A company called mm -hmm. Faktadruk, and um, mm -hmm. a terrible story with seven Heidelberg operators killed and uh, more than twenty people injured. And when you see the a uh, printing company on CNN and on 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 the large network chains. It is, it is a crater. It is. Uh, it's amazing that not more people died in in that attack. And then you said to me in um, that it reminded kind of because uh, your family was from Ukraine, um, not <laughs> and, and uh, basically before uh, just after the first world war and before the second world war, uh, they were also yes. bullied out by the Russians. Um, and um, I, I think it is interesting uh, to hear your story. So we're going to, to talk about that in a moment. But before we do that, I would like just your personal view and opinion about this, Rob, because I was just thinking that in these days, I think the, what the Ukrainians need the most is um, it is uh, they need guns, they need weapons, they need uh, money, they need support from democracies. Do you think that we should help them? <laughs> I always said I would never get involved in politics online, but here, here we are. Um, I do support Ukraine, and I'll preface my um, my statement with this with another statement that says that I have many Russian friends, I have many Ukrainian friends, and I love them both dearly. However, having seen the experience that my family had losing all of their land in Ukraine, losing all of their privileges, losing or experiencing the death of family members uh, due to the strife that happened during the Bolshevik revolution. I, I, yeah. I really, really feel for the people of Ukraine. All they want to do is live in peace. And so I, I do support it. Mm. The reason why I go so directly into this question is because um, there's so many different ways, because I also have uh, Russian friends. Uh, I would say most of my Russian friends live in Denmark today or in America, by the way, or in Canada, by the way. Uh, and, um, and uh, of course, still have uh, people that are also in the industry in, in Russia. And I think that when it comes to individuals, then most individuals are not to blame for the war. I think it is, uh, uh, in my opinion, and that is, of course, also political, but in my opinion, it seems that Vladimir Putin is the one to blame for, for most of the, uh, the, the human uh, tragical things that happens in, in Ukraine right now. And there is maybe a, a few similarities or many similarities to when the Bolsheviks, uh, uh, as you mentioned, were like, how many years ago is that? That was in the twenties, right? That your family was. 19, was uh, uh, 1919. Yeah. Hmm. 1918, and uh, maybe. 1919 and 1921. Hmm. The reason why you're so well up to date on this one is because uh, uh, your family has uh, basically kept notes and written a book about this. Maybe you can uh, tell me a little bit about uh, the background of the story and, and how, how you. I mean, how you see that? Because, I mean, stories that are written in its time is, of course, sometimes seen a little bit different when it comes on, let's say, a distance. Yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit about the book. Tell me a little bit about uh, what happens What happens to you when you read it. Uh, this is 
the book that uh, was written, and it is in the Mennonite archives in Winnipeg. A good portion of this book was written by my great grandmother, who, when he, she came to Canada, she decided to take some time to write her account. Um, I had not read this book when I got it, which is shameful, actually. I read it when the war broke out, and it was seriously emotional for me because it mm. felt like we were reliving history. Um, my grandmother was not a catastrophist. My grand, great-grandmother, I should say, did not write in emotional terms. She just wrote in factual terms of what happened to the family. And mm. you also have to know that traditionally, the Mennonites were Germans living in Ukraine. They were not Germans from fighting for Germany. So they were, mm. they were invited by um, Catherine the Great uh, from Prussia to farm the land. And the reason the farmland is so fertile today is because of the Mennonites occupying the land west of the Dnep River and developing it and, and working the farmland. And so they worked hard for and lived peaceably for over a hundred years there. Mennonites are known for, um, for a lot of things, but one of them is their pacifist, pacifism. They do not fight. They do not uh, go to war. Interestingly enough, in World War I, my grandfather, not my, gra my real grandfather, uh, who was the uh, son-in-law of the, uh, actually, sorry, not my grandfather, my, my gra great-grandmother's son, one of her sons, was conscripted into the army, but he would not fight. And then he ended up um, being... A, not a volunteer, but he was conscripted as a medic. So he mm -hmm. treated all the soldiers in World War I that were uh, for working for the Russian army. So he was on the Russian side. And then, but things quickly turned in, uh, during the Bolshevik Revolution around 1919, 1918. First of all, when, when the, um, Germans were actually fighting the Russians in World War I, there was a bit of a, uh, a difficulty because um, Germans in, in in Russia were seen as fighting. German Mennonites were seen as on on the uh, German side, which they weren't. They were pacifists. They would not fight. They were farmers. And so the first thing that happened is they lost their language rights. They wouldn't. They were were not allowed to speak German in their churches in their schools. So they adopted mm -hmm. Russian. In fact. What would happen is in the churches, there would be armed guards in the back, mm -hmm. making sure that they could not speak German, that they were speaking Russian. And then quickly mm -hmm. in 1919, when the revolution started, then things started to change because Lenin was in power and he adopted a pretty hard line view on ownership of land. So land was taken from us. And so all land was owned by government. Mm -hmm. And then eventually the government was going to mm -hmm. run the farms and the Mennonites would simply work for them, and which they did. But they, the Russians were not very good at, at farming and didn't understand it. So they brought the Mennonites back in to, to help manage those farms. During that time, during the revolution, uh, Lenin actually uh, encouraged the confiscation of land for many and anyone who was a landowner was seen as wealthy. So that was all Mennonite landowners. So during that time, there was a, there was also a group that were black armbands and they were bandits and they were, they were somewhat supported by the government, encouraged just to disrupt things. And it was during that time that, um, our families were, um, victim of a lot of pillaging a lot of robbery and a lot of killing. So my great grandfather, he was a, a he was interestingly enough, he he studied Russian poetry, he studied Russian literature, he studied mm -hmm. Russian language, he was a teacher, mm -hmm. he learned was learned from Moscow and he was a teacher in the system. However, he also became a lay preacher and he mm -hmm. was on a mission in a specific village uh, preaching in a tent. And that was uh, a fateful day for our family when the the 
the, the bandits, the local bandits came in and they rounded up all of the leaders of, of the church in a, in a, in a, uh, in a barn. And that's where they were all slaughtered mm. together with another, I think it was a, it was over a hundred people slaughtered that day in different villages. It was a very purposeful, mm. um, um, uh, killing of the leaders that they thought that were interrupting their power. Mm. And so it was, uh, my uncle Frank, who uh, uncle John, sorry, who went up the, to find him and they couldn't identify the body. They could only identify it by the color of his shirt mm. because it was such a, it was such a crazy thing. So, you know, my, my, my great grandmother mm. talks about it as a matter of fact and says, yes, that day, my, my husband died and then two months later my sister died and then my grandmother mm. died sister and grandmother mm. from typhus because the russian soldiers would occupy the the houses and in those houses mm. uh or the russian soldiers were not really clean they had a lot of lice and that carried typhoid and the typhus um illness mm. was spread to many, 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 many people. So many people died that way. So that's how they died. So three deaths in the family. But on the day of my grandfather's, great grandfather's funeral, my grand, great grandmother says, what a blessed day. It's foggy today. What? Your, your, your husband just died and was murdered. She says, well, we're able to bury him without the fear of the bandits coming in and killing us. So this went on for a little bit longer until it started to become personal and they were attacking our villages. And um, what would happen is the, the Russian army would come in and they would uh, occupy homes. Sometimes they would kill the leaders of the uh, farms, the owners of the farms. So if you were known as an owner of a farm, your life was at risk. Um, we escaped that fortunately, but there was also the banditry that happened. And then one night our family was attacked and uh, they came in with guns and started shooting. We ran to the attic. My aunt Elma, who I knew very dearly until well into my twenties, she was a little child then. And my uncle Frank threw her up into the attic through the hatch and they caught her and she, they ran up and they started shooting the ceiling. They had bricks in the, in the, uh, in already lining so they couldn't be killed that way. Then as the mm -hmm. uh, my uncle Frank jumped out of the window and uh, out of the gable and warned the neighbors, they all came shouting to the, to the house. And then uh, that sort of scared them off. But in on their exit, they threw a lantern to burn them, to basically burn the house down. And so fortunately, the lantern didn't break and it didn't catch fire. So they all escaped. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of our movement away from Russia. But mm. I I don't want to speak too long. I've already spoken a lot. I no, but I I have a few I have a few I have a few questions, uh, Rob, uh, because I was thinking that yeah. that um, I think that one of the things that has surprised me a little bit uh, since I started Inkis traveling the New World versus the Old World is that the New World, like the North America in particular, is uh, is a very um, curious on on the roots and the background and from where they uh, where they're written basically right and um, mm. when you hear stories like this and and you found that in your in your boxes and in your alley and and you basically started to uh, let's say re uh, visit your family uh, in, a, in a kind of let's say remote kind of way um, is is there is there is is the takeaways from the story uh, that we can learn from today? Well, I certainly don't complain anymore when I read a story like this. This the survival through the most difficult situations is possible. So I feel if, uh, when I read the pain here, I read the pain that is happening today in the Ukrainian people that are dying, mm. their families are dying, the place you're going to visit next week, you're going to visit people in grief. Mm. And mm. I read the story of survival and here I am today as a descendant mm. of these people. So there is hope, I believe, beyond mm. the conflict. Mm. And and uh, do you know, do you still have 
the, the distant relatives in Ukraine that has, uh, the, or, or did your entire family leave uh, or disappeared from, from Ukraine at that time? That's really hard to say. Um, most of them left. The people that were direct relatives of, of myself left at one point in the 1970s. I think it was an aunt showed up on our door and, mm -hmm. and, and she came for a visit. Her uncle had, her, her husband had been sent to Siberia to a gulag and had never returned. Mm -hmm. And so she had a story herself, but she was also an optimist, but she mm -hmm. came here. She was here for three weeks, three weeks. And for the first two weeks, she says, I don't believe what I'm seeing. This is mm -hmm. not true. I go, what are you talking about? She said, this is staged. This was staged for mm -hmm. me. And she did not believe <laughs> that we lived as we lived. And mm -hmm. uh, at the end, she was joking and she was fine. Mm -hmm. we kept in touch. Mm -hmm. But no, I don't really have too many relatives left in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, what you just told about, uh, that she saw... Uh, the wealth of the Western world uh, as a something staged. I think mm -hmm. that sometimes we forget how fortunate we are that we live in, in a part of the world where we have a higher level of security, uh, education, uh, free religion. Uh, we can even marry <laughs> whatever gender we want. Uh, we can uh, marry whatever color uh, we want to, to marry. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, we can buy almost anything that is produced on earth in our supermarkets and in our retail stores and, and the distribution and the network and the free speech, all the things that we maybe sometimes take a little bit too granted, but that is a result of, and that is a mirror when, when you talk about this is that, that, uh, mm -hmm. and that is why when, when I decided to go to uh, Kharkiv, um, I must say that it was with, it is with big considerations, of course, because, um, uh, just two days ago, only 10, 15 kilometers away from Kharkiv, uh, the Russians were testing a 3,000 kilo bomb, one of the biggest uh, hmm. bombs ever made. Um, and uh, my friends say, no worries, uh, if you uh, if you uh, do what the authorities say and, and flee when the alarm goes off and things like that, I mean, you should be safe. But it's always like when you decide to go into uh, something that is absolutely uncommon for most of us, fortunately, and also something that has a uh, potential risk. You have to weigh it against uh, the value of going. And the reason why I thought it is important to go is because Faktordruck, um is uh, one of the largest printing companies in Europe, uh, and uh, the division of uh, Kharkiv uh, was printing school books for for schools in uh, in all over Ukraine. And I think there's a lot of people that have no understanding of how big Ukraine is, but it is as big as the entire Midwest in the US, right? It is as big as Europe. Uh, it is a gigantic country. Uh, country. It takes by train going east west. It takes about 19 hours, right? It's a, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a vast country, right? And and we have to remember that when the Russians attack uh, a printing company doing school books, and they do it intentionally. I think it's because they realize how difficult it is to fight a nation if you have your nationalities, you have your language, you have your culture uh, protected. I mean, uh, you you spoke about some of the great uh, Russian authors uh, and composers, and that is the most amazing thing is that uh, when you see um, some of the Russian art and artists and authors are among the most fantastic authors in the world. Mm -hmm. And still they're able to have a community that foster evil right? uh, in a way that is mm -hmm. uh, sometimes beyond comprehension. So I decided I have to cover this story because it was covered by CNN and by other uh, cable, BBC and, you know, these big ones. And does that mean that we have to cover it in the printing industry? I thought so. I spoke to my wife and she says, you're so crazy. I cannot, I, I cannot, I cannot keep you back if you have already made a decision. Mm. What you're do you a think? Journalist. Yeah. Oh, is I, it stupid I, or is you. it? No, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I, your, your heart drives you. You're a journalist. You're a curious person. You're consistent 100% all the way through. You want to know the truth. 
Mm. And, um, and that's what we like about you is that you always speak the truth. And so it'll be very interesting. I think you might come up with some surprises that you can't orchestrate what you're going to think. Yeah. Um, and that happens just by experience, I think. Mm. I got a message yesterday from a, a woman that is from Ukraine, but now lives elsewhere. Um, and she uh, wrote to me that Kharkiv is uh, one of the most beautiful cities uh, when not mm. in war. And she wrote to me that she hopes that you will still be able to see some of the beauty of mm. the city wow. while you're there, right? And and wow. it is amazing because uh, when you when you see, uh, I will put that into the uh, into the edit of this film. Uh, I also hope I can get some photos from from your book as we spoke about to to mm. to tell a little bit about your story, but. I will try to put in some relevant photos so people can see how damaged the printing company uh, is and and why I also think this is important to do uh, as an industry media, basically, man. So, um, uh, Rob, when you talk to, I guess that that when you uh, when you look at uh, your family and and your heritage uh, on 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 the story that we just spoke about. Mm, is that something that your family still talks about from time to time, or does these stories die with the families as they grow older and older? I think I'm the one bringing it back to life. Uh, this this has been sitting on the shelf gathering dust. However, having said that, my my cousin is a, as an historian, mm, <laughs> so he, okay. mm. he corrects me when I'm wrong, and he continues to speak about that. Yeah, and we and we try to take both sides of the story too. Mm -hmm. I mean, my own uncle, we we sat and had lunch with him a couple of years ago, and just mm -hmm. you were, he said, I said, you were there. Tell me what you felt. What was the feeling? Why why did this happen? And mm -hmm. and so we got another side of the story that you know, mm -hmm. rich people sometimes can be targeted. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you become if you start to build up some degree of wealth people don't like you so much so mm. there's a there's an onus on each one of us to be benevolent mm. to those that work with us mm. um thank you for sharing your story here with the with with the audience uh maybe maybe uh, maybe when i have been in ukraine um maybe um i will call you again um I would love to talk to you. Just to to give you my insights. You know, you're of not being you're there. not crazy. Then, uh, <laughs> at least I say I came back and will call you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Make sure you come back to call me. Yeah. I've been I've been to many conflict zones. I've been close to danger at times in my life and some of my crazy travels. But I was single at the time when I did that. Mm. But I also found there were pockets of hope and there were always pockets of safety. Mm. So the media will always tell you about where a bomb hits. So I suspect you're going to be in a pocket of safety. And I do mm. pray that you will be safe. I want to hear that story. <laughs>